Every single day you have angels that you set in motion when you do things according to God's will, such as praising him and thanking him. Your angels have an assignment to bring your life into abundance and health and joy and peace. So you don't ever want to injure the ministry of your angels. Your angels ministry can be hindered or injured by you. And if your angel's ministry is injured or hindered by you, that means that they are not empowered to win against demon spirits, satanic kings that are lodged in the second heaven. The second heaven band and company of evil spirits and wicked spirits and spiritual hosts, those demons carry a power that govern how the world goes. That's why Apostle Paul said, don't be conformed to the world. Because being conformed to the world means that you learn the literature of these fallen angels. They are lodged in the second heaven, which is above space. They have planets of scheming. They have lands where they govern activity that they want to accomplish on earth abominations that they want to fulfill through man, wickedness that they want to establish in man's heart. So in Noah's day, the reason why there was so much violence is, was because those second heaven demons were ruling what was happening on earth. The Bible said that the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually, which means that they were rulers which the word of God talk about Ephesians 6, rulers of the darkness of this age. So they were ruling the evil that those men were thinking. So everything that those men wanted to do, they were empowering their mind to go forth and do it, to upset the Lord, to grieve the spirit of God. So they were sending ideas from that second heaven. Now, saints, the powerful thing about life is that God on purpose allowed this second heaven to be set up. He allowed it because he saw it that it would be a, a place where you will be free to make a decision on sincerely serving him rather than being a robot. So God didn't get rid of that second heaven because they are the ones that send vain imaginations to you. They are the ones that guide you into a wrong relationship. They are the ones that encourage you to be stubborn or rebellious or hostile or wicked or corrupt or distracted or tempted. They are the one that encourage your weariness, your weakness, your fatigue, your anger, your jealousy, your animosity, your quick temperedness. They are the ones that are encouragers of your prayerlessness, your dishonor, your disloyalty, your unfaithfulness, your strife. And with them being present, now man could choose whether or not they wanted God's will. So if God removed them, everybody would be a robot. Everybody, you, you wouldn't know light from darkness. You wouldn't know sincerity from purity from disloyalty, you wouldn't be able to comprehend who is who because everybody will be serving God by default. But with the enemy resident, now people could choose whether or not they wanted the will of God or the will of their flesh. The reason why so many people serve Satan is because Satan offers you to feel good now. But if you study the side effect of feeling good, according to Satan, you feel bad. Why do you think that people commit suicide? Why do you think people shoot themselves? Why do you pe think people hang themselves? They don't feel good. They don't feel good. And after you live a life of doing what you thought made you feel good, you don't feel good when it's all said and done. The soul wasn't created to make independent decisions apart from what God preferred. 
So when you make the same way, have you ever noticed children? If you study a little child, if they do something that you don't want them to do, you'll see that they feel good while they're doing against what you want. But afterwards, they'll feel bad. Why is that? Because the soul that God gave to every single person that exists today, it was only going to receive satisfaction from doing things his way, which is what we call righteousness. So Jesus said in the Beatitude, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, which means fulfilled. When he said filled, that word filled literally means that they were going to be complete. They was not going to long for nothing. And the void within them was going to be filled to overflowing. When he said those that hunger and thirst for my way of doing things, my ideas, my preference, he said those people will have a non-vacant soul, a soul that's satisfied with my presence my power, my provision, and my pleasure. Now, David says something powerful, I think in Psalm 16, that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So Satan has attempted to blind mankind with a false pleasure that God had already promised. God had already promised that he was going to give you pleasure. At his right hand is pleasures forevermore. So you like, I want pleasure in my life. Well, God, like, duh, that's what I made you to have. But see, here's a part that many people never recognize. Do you qualify for the pleasure that you're placing a demand on? Do you qualify for that pleasure? Yeah, I qualify for that pleasure because the blood was shed for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Jesus qualifying you. We could be going into the club and I could say, this person should come in. But that don't mean that you're going to act right. You're going to meet the qualification while you're in the club. Now, saints, I don't go to the club. I'm just giving you a, a reference. I'm just giving you like a, something that you can piggyback on in your imagination. That don't mean that you're not going to break bottles while you're in the club. That don't mean that you're not going to punch somebody in the face. That don't mean that you're going to break the qualification. So when I say, do you qualify for pleasure? Yes, the blood of Jesus can make you qualify for pleasure. But do you have the soul condition to steward pleasure properly, safely, and purely. Because, saints, let me, let me show you this. David had got to a zone where he, he, he had full uh, pleasure, qualification from God. But when he kills Bathsheba's husband, we see a violation to that pleasure, a mismanagement to that pleasure. Now, God wasn't mad that he got Bathsheba because God had already gave him that pleasure privilege. But God gets mad that he kills a man, pits him in the front of the battle on purpose, knowingly knowing that he was going to get shot first by the arrow, knowing that they was going to wound him first and he was going to die. And God was upset with his mishandling of the pleasure which shows you that David's soul was not being stewarded properly for pleasure. So can you, do you qualify for the pleasure that you want from God? Oh, I wish God would give me a mansion. But who's going to be in that mansion? Who will you invite on holidays to that mansion? Who will you have barbecues with? Who will sit in your theater? Who will sit in your pool? Who will sit in your living room? Who will you watch movies with in that mansion? See, these are the questions that is not being magnified when you put a demand on God to give you something. What's going to happen after he give it to you? Who will you become? 
And who will you allow to indulge in that with you? So there are other elements to God's inheritance being made apparent to your life because there are, diff there are different aspects of what's going to happen when that thing materializes. Man, if God gave me a million dollars, I'd be so happy. But what will you do with the million? Can God tell you to sow 500,000 off the jump? And you'd be like, no, 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 no. I already want a house for 700,000. I already, I already done pit in my... And is your soul in the proper humility to receive the petitions that God will grant you? Remember, God doesn't want to bless you so that you could be empowered to move in curses all over again. And how many times do you take the time to really think about? See, let me, let me say something real profound to you that's real scary. And, and I, I want to show this to you and you, you're probably never going to hear this again. Or you probably never heard this ever before. Say a woman is saying, Lord, I pray that you'll give me the gifts of healings, the gifts of healings, Lord. I pray that you'll give me the gifts of healings. And God gives her the gifts of healings. And somebody is being judged by God. They activated this. And it's scheduled, it's, it's actually scheduled that they depart with a terminal illness. And the person with the gifts of healing start going, saying, Lord, how could you let this man suffer? How could you let this be? Your blood was shed to deliver this man. How could you let this be? And they go in prayer. And I pray for the healing. I command you right now to be healed. And, and the person goes. Now look, the healing, the gifts of healings is so beautiful. But reaping what you sow, God not being mocked, the wages for sin is death. You have to catch that Isaiah didn't go back and talk to Hezekiah because Isaiah just wanted to. It was Hezekiah that went and humbled himself in prayer. And Hezekiah let the Lord know, I want to do things your way. Hezekiah let the Lord know, I'm ready to lay down my pride. I done drifted from you. I know I haven't been seeking you. I done got tied up in this wealth, this abundance. I done got tied up in this kingship. I done got tied up in this, this, uh, this Babylonian system of my day. And I'm not even into your literature. I'm following the ways uh, of the world. I'm following the ways of the heathen. I'm following in the ways of other nations. I'm not governing this nation that you picked me over the way that you wanted me to. I don't forgot my regiment. And now Isaiah comes and pronounces, you're restored, you're healed. You have an extension of life. It wasn't just because God is merciful, but we see that Hezekiah receives the mantle of mercy towards God. And remember, I told you mercy is an opportunity given. So now he's saying, Lord, I give you the opportunity now to teach me all over again. I give you the opportunity now to guide me in the way of righteousness. I give you the opportunity now to show me what you don't like so that I can fix it. I give you the opportunity now to impart your spirit of wisdom to me so that I don't do nothing foolish. I don't say nothing foolish. I don't connect with nobody foolish. I don't watch nothing foolish. I don't listen to nothing foolish. You see the switching of Hezekiah's approach to the Lord. And then you see Isaiah the prophet switching the verdict. Now, saints, I told you of Ahab, which is the husband of Jezebel. Ahab was a killer. He was wicked. He was moving in the powers of darkness. But when Elijah gave him that word, he went into a fast. He went into seeking God. 
He went into humbling himself. And then the Lord said, I'm not going to do it in your day. You're not going to see none of the stuff I said I was going to do. I done changed my mind because you changed your mind. Saints, you could change God's mind if you change your mind. Everything about you that's wicked could be changed. Stop wasting time on things that are not from God in your personality and in your desires and in your appetite because you're missing out on money. You're missing out on true pleasure. You're missing out on the schedule of God. Everything that you're violating God to do, God could give it to you safely without any consequence or backlash. Let's go to Proverbs chapter four, verse eight. It's talking about wisdom being the principal thing in verse seven. And then it says, therefore get wisdom. And then all you're getting a wisdom, get understanding. Why would the word tell you that after you get wisdom, you still need to get something else? Because wisdom is not independent. It's a combo. The same way you ever went to a fast food restaurant and the fast food people are like, do you want to have the combo or you want that singular? Well, if you notice if you get something singular, you really don't enjoy it that much because you want something to drink with it. You, you want something that to go alongside of it. Well, that's how wisdom is. A person could get wisdom from God and still go to hell. Because wisdom is not singular. Wisdom must be accompanied by understanding. And if you don't get understanding, the wisdom that you have will become wickedness. Because you will not perform what you know to perform. I've met many wicked people in my life. I probably met more wicked people than, uh, uh, yeah. In, in life, you're going to meet more wicked people. You're going to meet people that know a high level, but they flow at the lowest level. You're going to meet people that have brights, but yet they are discovered in darkness. You're going to have people that have dominion for wealth, but you're going to see them struggle financially. You're going to see people that have dominion and glory for sexual purity, but you're going to see them flow in uh, being promiscuous, adulterous, lustful, fornication. What is fornication? It's sex that God did not schedule. Fornication is sex that God did not permit, he did not put his stamp of approval on the sex. So when two people are having the sex, it is not what God had ordained to happen. It's happening because both of them are fueled with lust. That's what fornication is. You notice the Bible says that if a man looks at a woman to lust after her, it is adultery that he's committing in his heart. Well, doesn't a husband look at his wife to sleep with her? So why isn't that adultery for the husband? Because that husband has authorization from God. So both of them are looking at a woman to sleep with it. But one has the license from God. Now, saints, I'm not talking about natural license. I'm not talking about natural license. I, I promise you I'm not. And I don't care if I don't I don't care if I get controversial backlash over that. I, I want I want you to understand clearly. I'm not talking about going to a flesh and blood man and telling the flesh and blood man, this is my wife, this is my husband, we are married, we love each other. I'm talking about staying in the face of the Holy Ghost, sexless, sexless, not having no sex. And I'm talking about the Holy Ghost now being able to guide you. If he wants you to stand before a man and a man pronounce you a wife and husband, or if, if, if he wants to lead you to, just like they used to do in the Bible, they never had no ceremony. They never had no ceremony. We see that the man would just enter into the woman that was his wife. We see that Adam, we never see a ceremony. God just give him his woman. Now, saints, did you know that when God gave him his wife, 
they wasn't supposed to have sex instantly. As a matter of fact, they wasn't having sex when he gave her to him because there is a time frame to have sex. So when the woman came, as beautiful as she was, it wasn't supposed to go into sex. There's more to a woman than sex and there's more to a man than sex. God wanted both of them to fulfill the assignment, him leading and her helping. And that was going to be the payoff that they was going to intertwine together, have sex, and then create another being that was immersed in their love for one another. They wasn't supposed to have sex. I want to say this. That's why when people have sex, their eyes opened up, open up to how to rebel against God. If you ever see a young girl when she wants to have sex or she has sex, you study how she starts disrespecting her parents. If you study a young man when he has sex or when he wants to have sex, he become impatient with instruction and authority. He doesn't like anyone that deters him from self uh, uh, from being loose. He wants no self-control. He wants no rules. That happens. Whenever a teenager starts disrespecting their parents, they're either on their way to sex or they're already having sex. That's why the, the mouthpiece start talking off. And you like, I, and a lot of times parents can't even recognize their child. You can't recognize them because there's a demon inside them. Parents, when you can't recognize your children, it's because they are possessed by a spirit that you don't know about. Of course, you can't recognize them. They talk to you different because the spirit is talking to you. And the, I'm going to tell you how spirits mock parents. The spirit will actually tell you who they are. They'll tell you, I'm not doing what you say. That's what the spirit telling you. The spirit telling you, no, I possess this body now. So this is not who you raise. Saints, now you understand the mystery of why God sends your children through a baby stage so that you could dominate them with training. They can't do that. You ever seen a, a, a baby disrespecting their parents? No. They don't have the ability. They're handicapped to do that. It's, it's only when they become developed in knowledge and abilities that you see the disrespect happens. Staying in a low place is a blessing. Since I, I tell you, I know people that's poorer than me that don't pray more than me. And I know people that's poorer than me that don't give thanks more than me. I thank the Lord for everything. I thank the Lord for everything I possess. I go one by one and find random things that I own and I thank God for it. I praise God for everything that I have. I praise God for everything that I see. I give God glory for every meal that I have. I praise God for every water, for every juice, for every product that's in my possession. I praise God for my teeth. Some some mofos ain't got no teeth. They're more like you. Well, you hear your gift right before you. You 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 we are hallelujah, hallelujah. They they ain't got no teeth, but they won't praise God. Meanwhile, I got teeth, and I praise God for my teeth. There's people that don't have what you have, yet your level of performance is way higher than theirs. Your level of reaction is way more superior than them. They don't have what you have, and yet there is no zeal. There's no passion. There is no pursuit of God. I praise God for everything. You know, my hairstylist looked just like Suzanne. You know, Suzanne, Suzanne been following me for years. Suzanne left a lot. I really hope that Suzanne never gets corrupted by the evil one. Do you see that Versace outfit that I wore? Suzanne bought me that 
all the way. She shipped it from the United Kingdom, I believe. That passed through. Customs came all the way to America. The uh, Versace shirt that I had did a profile in. It was Suzanne. She bought me Versace jackets. Not only that, she sent me candy in the mail all the way from United Kingdom. These, these are the certain women that I have in the ministry. I have many certain women in the ministry. Now, meanwhile, do you know that Suzanne has never met me in the flesh? She's never been to a conference. Because they they haven't allowed her to travel. When you overseas, they don't let you come to America. You gotta go through all these different processes to get passports and 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 different type of things. But she, but she is persistent. I pray that she. Now let me just say this: When I met Suzanne, Suzanne was poor. Suzanne never asked me for nothing. I taught Suzanne. I gave Suzanne an impartation of wisdom. Suzanne now makes money. Money comes to Suzanne from different streams. All because she listened. I sent the word to her. I never laid my hands on her. I never gave her all. I never hugged her. I never kissed her. I never gave her a, 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 a prayer session, an intercession moment. I never called on the phone and said, you, I, I need you to be blessed. I need you. I released the I never did none of that. She served me. And now she carries me. Now, I know Suzanne before I met her. I know that, um, I, I, I know that, um, I know, I know her history by the spirit. That's all I'm going to say. And I have seen her pursue change. There's a lot of you all, I don't look at you physically or verbally. I don't converse with you verbally. I study you in prayer. I look at you through the eyes of my spirit. I dwell on you sharply without physical eyes. And I know what's going on. I zoom in on your life because I care about you. Not I'm just spying on you because I want to create some type of harm. But I spy on you so that I could know how you are dealing with what I give you. I want to know what's happening to my talents. I've given talents to many people and they dug it in the ground. Now, that's not the case with everybody. And I'm very grateful for the people that are not digging my talents into the ground, but they're giving me an exchange for my time. Today um, or yesterday, as soon as I met uh, Bennett, Bennett didn't know he was coming here. As soon as I met Bennett, Bennett hands me a seed in my hand. Sows the seed. Constantly keep on sowing. He's given me a return on my talents. My time is not going in vain. Now, I pray that Bennett never lets evil come and resonate in him. I pray, but I can't stop what he permits. I can just do my part to remain an impartation system to Bennett. But I pray that he never falls away. That prayer may not be answered. Because whenever prayers consist of someone else's will, their will could debunk your prayers. Remember Jesus, he maketh intercession for the saints. But yet the word of God talked about that there'll be a great falling away. That means that saints will fall away. So prayers of Jesus don't always get answered. It, especially when it includes the will of man, because your will could choose to go against what he's. My, 
My hairstylist looked just like Suzanne. I mean, she looked just like Suzanne. She's now I've never I've never seen Suzanne's height, but my hair my my hairstylist is the same height as Suzanne. My hairstylist looked just like Suzanne. Saints, everybody that I meet. Because my life is, is so heavenly wrapped. They look like people that I mentor. They look like people that I've changed their life. They look like people that I have ministered to. People that I've healed by the power of God. People that I've blessed according to the word of wisdom. And they take on their countenance. And saints, the thing about it, when people take on a spiritual approach to their prophet, they never fall. Because you know me by the spirit. There's a place where you dwell on your man of God to the degree that you'll see yourself with them 500 years from now. You'll see yourself in eternity. You'll see yourself doing assignments with them. And you'll recognize, hey, this life is just a tiny speck of my real story. No wonder I can't turn against this man. Because this man is really God just housing himself in a physical body because he's the one that loves me. He doesn't want me to fall. He doesn't want me to miss. He doesn't want me to be his enemy. When you dwell and you contemplate your man of God according to your spirit, you will understand this is the body that Jesus picked to talk to me. This is the body that Jesus picked to touch me, to say hello to me, to stir my soul, to arise the gifts of the spirit in me. This is how Jesus wanted to smile at me. This is how Jesus wanted me to view him. This is how Jesus wanted me to hear his literature, his revelation, his mysteries. When you view your man of God according to the spirit, all type of thoughts will well up in you that are shocking. You'll recognize that if I give him water. Do you know how many times somebody offers me something that I don't want? And then I'll go back and take it just so that they could get blessed. You know, you could go to a place, they offer you water. Would you like some water? No, I, I know I'm okay, thank you. And then you'll say, go give me some water. Because you don't want the water. But if you take the water, they get the reward. I do that all the time. People are like, would you like me to carry that for you? No, I said, yeah, carry it for me. I walk places, people be like, can I, can I open this door for you? I don't want to be disrespectful. No, 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 you open the door for me. I've seen men with their wife, never met me before. They'll hold the door so that I can come in. And their wife be looking at them with jealous eyes. <laughs> their wife be trying to figure that out. But if that man could see that my angels are whispering in his ear and saying, hey, get the door for him. And then that man looks back and has a thought and he feels compelled. Now his family is walking ahead of him, but he has stopped to open the door for me. And they're wondering, do you know him? Of course, he don't know me physically, but he knows me spiritually. Because even that man came from me. That man was created by me. But I'm just in this physical body. And I could teach that man to see me if he wants. When that man stands before the judgment seat, the film going to play. And he's going to see Jehovah was with me on earth. 
I saw Jehovah. I did something for Jehovah. I had a chance to meet Jehovah. Many people say, what would I do if I met God? I will ask God about this and I will see God and I will tell God what, what do he want and I will please God. And then God, he, he sits right there, right next to you. He stands right there. He holds a conference. He talks to you. He visits you on social media. He says hello to you. He wishes you happy birthday. He says hello to you. He, he talks to you, makes you laugh. He makes you feel good. He makes you feel safe. He makes you feel joyous. You feel hope when he's talking to you and you don't know that you have already met God so many times. Jesus in disguise. Jehovah passing by. Here Jesus is a man and these blind men start screaming out at the top of their lungs, Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on us. Heal us, heal us, open our eyes. Lord, only you can, Lord, only you can. And, and the disciples, they started telling the men, shut up, okay? Oh, wait, wait, you're, dis you're, dis you're disrupting our, our path. Hush, 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 hush. And Jesus say, uh-uh, wait, 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 wait. What can I do for you all? The disciples is looking at Jesus like, no, Jesus, don't bother with them. They're disrespectful. And Jesus is like, I wish you was like that. I wish that you could see me. You done saw me go to the bathroom, so now you can't see me. You done saw me eat bread and bananas in the Jerusalem market. You done seen me eat chicken and fish. You done seen me sit down. You done seen me sleep on a boat. You saw me sleeping on the boat. So now you can't see me. You heard me snoring on the boat. Now you can't see me. I wish that you would act like them. The disciples was so far gone that they were shutting up someone that was meeting the preference that Jesus wanted. They thought that they was bad. Meanwhile, they was carrying glory to God, the personality that Jesus wanted. That's what Jesus wanted, somebody hype. Jesus wanted someone that was on fire, someone that had lost their cotton picking. Somebody! that had been stirred with the spirit of God to become a worshiper. That's what Jesus was looking for. And the disciples thought that they was doing Jesus a favor by shutting up those men that was crying aloud when really those men was fitting a picture that Jesus had longed for. They was an answer to Jesus's prayer. That's why Jesus answered their prayer. They was an answer to Jesus's petition. That's why Jesus answered their petition. They were an answer to Jesus's his dreams. That's why Jesus answered their dreams. You reap what you sow. When you become a harvest to Jesus, Jesus gives you every harvest that you've named, every harvest that you declared, every harvest that you prayed for, because you were a harvest to Jesus.